Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so the first section is about uh, SmartNIC programming models. Uh, before we talk about SmartNIC programming models, we first need to understand what is a SmartNIC, what makes it really smart. And uh, uh, hint, it's got a process on it. It's not just a regular chip with like a pipeline or, or table lookups. Then we'll have a look at uh, different ways of using these smart NICs. So you could use pre-programmed firmware, in which case um, you, it just accelerates whatever's going on on the host already. Or you can write your own firmware, which is what most of the day is about. We'll have a look at different um, programming and offload models. Um, so you can actually interact with it while just programming on the server. You don't necessarily have to program um, the, the, the SmartNIC itself, and you can still get benefit out of it. But uh, there are also different ways in which you can run your program on the SmartNIC or a combination of a server and the SmartNIC. Then we'll have a look at uh, different uh, data paths and, and how they work, um, uh, different ways in which the packets can flow to your VMs or VNFs or your applications. Finally, some words on the um, SmartNIC performance, and then delving right into the silicon architecture, software architecture, to understand, in theory, what you're going to see in the rest of the day in, in practice. So without further ado, uh, what is a smart nick? Um, can you eat it? Um, how far can you throw it, etc.? cetera? Um, smart nicks uh, just look like regular nicks at first glance. Um, these ones are half height, half length, 25 watt. So you can put them in pretty much any server. There's another category, um, you can see them listed at the bottom here, Julio Alex, that are maybe full height. And um, these are typically more your 100 gig class, whereas the, the half height goes up to 40 gig. You can see they're available with different port counts, different media speeds, etc. But the key point here is that they have a, a huge number of um, C programmable cores. So you can see there's almost um, five, more than 500 threads on this. Compare that to a typical server processor that's maybe got um, two sockets and maybe 10 cores and maybe dual hyperthreaded. So you can see it's an order of magnitude, more threads. And that is really what gives it the ability to, to go and process packets at, at high rates. There's also DRAM for large lookup tables, for state tables, etc. And another point, um, everything to do with the packet, the whole day in the life of a packet is implemented in software here. Whereas with regular NICs, there's typically a fixed structure of tables. And you can maybe change the table entries to, to, to define what is a tunnel, uh, what MAC addresses should it match, etc. But um, that fixed table structure constrains you. Whereas if you implement the entire data path in software, you can do whatever you want. So uh, the firmware is dynamically downloadable. Um, you can burn it into the flash if you really want to, but what we typically do is we just stick it in slash lib slash firmware on the server. And um, there are already written data paths that um, are available from, from the SmartNIC vendor typically. Um, that go and offload things like OVS, vRouter, Linux IPsec, et cetera, et cetera. Um, eBPF is, is, is kind of an odd one out here because on the one hand, eBPF is something that exists on Linux and the SmartNIC can be fully compatible with it. So it will offload whatever you do with eBPF in the Linux kernel. But on the other hand, eBPF is also a bit of a programming tool, programming language, a little virtual machine. So you could therefore um, see eBPF also as the, the machine instruction set for various languages. Um, 
Now, um, you could also go and develop your own firmware in, in languages like P4 or C. There's a whole um, integrated development environment available, etc. And we'll see that today. But um, there's also a hybrid of these, where you could have a C plugin, for example, embedded in P4 um, with um, maybe P4 embedded in OVS. Um, so, so there's many permutations and combinations that one can uh, consider here. Um, so looking at the programming models, uh, the first model that, that we talked about there is where it goes and, and emulates something like OpenV switch, vRouter, Linux IPsec, etc. So in that case, there's an existing data path on the server. And this data path may be in user mode, in kernel mode, in a mix of those. Uh, one goes and creates a compatible implementation of that data path on the SmartNIC. And therefore, if, if there's a structure like matching and actions like OpenFlow, which, which you would find in OVS, you need to go and duplicate that functionality. If, if you need to encrypt and decrypt packets like IPsec, you would do the same. But um, you would try to offload um, the capability, but also the table entries that are needed to go and, and do the work. So, so if there's a, a new flow entry in OpenFlow that would be copied to the card, if there's a new security association, IPsec, that would also be made available to, to the SmartNIC. Then the traffic, the idea is to get most of the traffic handled either port to port or port to VM or application and, and back out again, or VM to VM, by the SmartNIC. So, so the idea is that the data path on the server uh, no longer needs to process a lot of traffic. There is the concept of, of, of fallback to the server. And this fallback is done in, um, in two different dimensions you could fall back certain protocols that you expect to not happen very often. For example, let's take ARP. If you're doing tens of millions of packets per second of ARP processing, you're really doing something terribly wrong. So therefore, it doesn't make sense to, to, to do that. So, so ARP would be good to fall back to the host. But TCP and UDP, you want to get onto the blue lines rather than, than the red lines. But if, if let's say, only 1% of the traffic takes that fallback path, then you've significantly offloaded um, the server. So on this basis, the ones that have already been done are um, OVS vRouter contract, which is part of the NF tables in Linux, which is usable from OVS. EBPF, etc., and more are, are in development. Uh, the next way of, of programming these things would be, um, I mean, on, on, on the left column, maybe you don't program them, you just use them. You just use them with things like OpenStack or Open Daylight or whatever, and whatever interfaces they offer could be programming interfaces, which could be just web interfaces or management interfaces will just work. But what if you do want to program them? Then similar to graphics cards that maybe have something like OpenGL, where there's a high-level API on the server that you can call and you just say, go and render this image for me. Um, similar to that, there's APIs available specific to networking that one can call. And then you kind of interact with the data path on the server without necessarily knowing that it is offloaded. But um, because that data path is also aware of a SmartNIC, it can delegate the work further down to the SmartNIC. 
so here the languages, the tools, and so on would be um, the ones you, you typically use on the server, C, C++, Java, Python, Ruby, whatever, whatever you want to use. And um, APIs in this category include the DPDK Palma driver. That's just giving you packets, maybe with metadata. Um, there's also the eBPF APIs. Um, there's an emerging category of APIs more specific to, to networking and, and match action based uh, processing, cryptography, etc., that are emerging. And we are actually starting up an initiative at OPNEV um, at the moment. Um, we, we, we'll have a whole um, a mini summit on, on Monday in Beijing at the OPNEV conference about this. Um, to go and create a better API for applications to go and interact with the network, but still sit on the server and just have it all offloaded and accelerated transparently. Uh, so what if that is actually not good enough? What if you don't just want a existing data path or some API to a data path? So in the graphics world, the equivalent would be you don't just want to call um, OpenGL or DirectX, you want to go and program the shaders yourself. Um, so so these, this is where languages like P4 come in, where you can actually write code um, in that language and have it execute on the smart NIC. Why would you want to do that? Um, you would have things like uh, protocol independence, where you want to define your own data plan protocols. You want to maybe have more flexible arrangement of match tables. Uh, you want to maybe just do matching of expressions rather than tables or do um, stateful operations, etc., etc. So in this case, you have full control. You, 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 you're writing your entire data path. But unfortunately, because you do everything yourself, you now have to go and do um, things like OpenStack, Open Daylight, all these things as well, all those integrations to make it a complete system. And that's where the, the hybrid comes in, where you can leverage um, the, the first three columns and you just add a little bit of code in a sandbox or a plugin that uh, is like your secret source, your custom telemetry you want to do your custom denial of service protection uh, that is needed to cope with the latest uh, wanna cry attack or something like that. So that is really then the best of all worlds with that hybrid um, option. So let's look a bit at the data paths and how they traditionally work. Um, so there's something called SRIOV out there and uh, a traditional NIC allows you to use the SRIOV model to map ports or um, it's got a few options like maybe MAC addresses that it can look for or VLAN tags on the network and all traffic matching th those criteria get um, forwarded to a certain SRIOV virtual function. So in this case, uh, you would have OpenStack go and set it up. There are these ML2 plugins for OpenStack that, that will configure it. The configuration gets put into the hardware, but then the whole configuration system falls away and um, the, the NIC can operate autonomously. So the benefit here is you can get quite high throughput, but you have very limited flexibility because you can only say, okay, this MAC address must go to this VM or application. That VLAN tag must go there. You don't really have um, a programming option um, there. Uh, the other issue with this is the poor manageability because these VMs are tightly coupled to those um, virtual functions on, on the NIC. So you cannot go and migrate the VM around the network. Uh, there's another model where maybe you have a data path, open vSwitch, vRouter, you could write your own in P4, and it all executes in software. 
And now you go and, and configure and control it with the CLI or with OpenStack. And because it's all very soft, um, you can do a lot of matching actions, whatever you want to do. And then the connection to the applications or virtual machines, maybe something like Virtio or tap devices, um, with pairs, etc. Here you have, um, again, the option for a bit of a fast path. So for example, vRouter and OVS um, use the user space for control, and then they put entries into tables in the kernel, and the forwarding is just done by the kernel. But still, so it, at least it doesn't have to go to user space, but still it uses cycles. So this gives high expressiveness, but it consumes many cores. Um, alternatively, if you constrain the number of cores and, and make that the fixed point, you're not going to get high throughput. So with a smart NIC, you, you, you get um, almost like the combination of these characteristics, where you could have the, the offloaded data path using the offload model we discussed earlier. Uh, can do all the features of the uh, host data path. So if there's matching going on, it'll do it. Actions like modify packet, drop packet, in tunnel, it'll do the same things. But it can still deliver the data to the VMs or applications with SRIOV virtual functions. It's also a VertIO capability to run with the VertIO drivers, which um, then you don't need any vendor-specific drivers. And in this case, um, your, your data path um, tables are really populated as a, as a part of the normal operation. In, in the case of OVS, uh, you'll see the tables get populated based on traffic. First packet of a flow will go to the kernel, go to user space, will cause a flow entry to be installed in the kernel, like number two, and will we'll get copied over into SmartNIC as in number three. But then once it's all set up, um, the, 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 there's also a, a flow tracker in, in front to, to go and speed up things. Uh, once it's all set up, the traffic can go more directly to the virtual machines or applications. It's even possible to go and uh, offload the connection tracking, which is uh, the stateful firewall or OpenStack security groups um, that uh, people may be familiar with. And on the same basis, by, by synchronizing the table entries, but performing the work on the smart NIC, this can be offloaded. So um, this then gives us the benefit of, of having that intelligence in, in your data path without consuming the cycles on the host because the entire um, switching subsystem on the host is only invoked for the few, first few packets in the flow. And then the, the actual fast path runs um, th through uh, probably from the flow tracker on directly to execute action and then directly to the to the virtual functions. Uh, so this gives you the combination of the the performance of SRIOV, the the flexibility of VertIO, and then the core saving um, associated with the the SmartNIC's many threats, as we discussed. So here's an example of the type of throughput improvement one can get. The kernel space OVS in, in certain test scenario um, used 12 cores to, to get to 5 million packets per second. Uh, user space or DPDK OVS got a higher throughput. And the SmartNIC got an even higher throughput still, five times better than the kernel. But if you look at these core numbers, the, the uh, SmartNIC was able to do this all with just a fraction of a core because it offloaded all the work, all the heavy lifting for the, for the rest of the flows. 
Um, so that is, is really why one would go and, and use SmartNICs to, to get the higher performance and um, also high throughput, low latency, low CPU usage. So to just visualize that, um, whereas in a typical application, maybe half of your, your resources, an entire socket is consumed by the networking and the other half is available for whatever um, application, in the case of the carriers, they, they like NAV currently, so they would say whatever VNFs they run, half of the server is available, whereas with the smart NICs, um, most of the, the server is still available for application processing. Um, so if we went and, and re replaced the data path with something like P4, this is now where we go and develop our entire own data path. All these characteristics would still be there, but you would need to go and do it yourself. In terms of the integration of OpenStack, you have to go and develop this control agent. In terms of um, the data path, you have to go and develop that. In terms of the uh, populating the tables, um, somebody needs to go and do that. So currently the state of the industry is that these things are not standardized. Um, the tools you'll see, be using later in the day are offering you an Apache Thrift-based interface. So that interface number two, that's uh, kind of generated when you write your P4 program. And then you can write your own control agent. But because we don't know what the program's going to do um, in, in the SDK, uh, we, 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 whoever writes the P4 data path will have to go and write the P4 control in order to integrate it with the likes of OpenStack. But at least as far as the SmartNIC goes and the interaction with the virtual machines and the applications, that part is, is also just like with the pre-programmed model uh, available. So to summarize then, um, with the SRIOV traditional approach, um, you get limited expressiveness but high throughput. And with the intelligent data paths written yourself or, or just use the OVS one, you get high expressiveness and limited throughput while, while eating up the CPU. And uh, with the fully programmable approach, you get kind of the best attributes of, of, of all of these combined. So that's kind of why one would use um, smart NICs in, in networking. So I think today you're probably going to not really use very high uh, throughput because we're just going to send a few packets here and there to, to validate that the programs we write work. But you can actually um, hook it up to XCL Aspirant and C line rate um, forwarding if one wants to. So let's now delve into the silicon and have a look at um, how the chip actually does this. So as I mentioned already, um, kind of the secret of the chip is the huge number of threads. And this is actually very important that um, it is not a cache-based architecture. It's, it's, it's a multi-thread based architecture because the the reason why uh, this gives you a high throughput is with networking you keep getting these annoying packets coming to you all the time and every packet can potentially be different so 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 not only are the packets continuously flushing out your caches and your processor the packets need to be looked up and the one packet is this IP address, hits this part of your routing table. The other packet is not even IP and it needs to be wildcard classified using these criteria, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the working set of networking, the amount of memory touched with all these packets coming in all the time is, is a huge amount. Um, and with these many threads, it's possible to hide the latency to basically, while one thread is doing one lookup, 
um, or one stateful operation in the case of firewalling to, to remember the TCP flag state of that connection. The other thread um, can keep running. So effectively, you are hiding your memory latency by, by using the threads rather than relying on a cache which can help you if, if your working set is small but not if, if, your, if your working set is large and you do a little bit of work on every cache line. In addition to this, um, there are these um, hardware accelerators or function accelerators. So, so you can see them there in the, in the lower right corner. They do things like hashing, uh, statistics, uh, cryptography, etc. And they can be invoked by the uh, C code running on the programmable course. So a thread would go and execute and then at some point it might need to um, do a metering operation, write limiting. And it will fire off an instruction to the function accelerator to say implement this meter. That meter would then be atomic, in other words a lockless. Um, so that multiple threads can simultaneously go and execute this. And uh, this way the, the, the hardware takes care of um, the, uh, the thread safety, the, the concurrency, such that the threads don't need to go and say lock, read, modify, write, unlock. And this is another very important characteristic that, that gets higher packet rates by having the, the multi-threading work well with the, the uh, function accelerators. Other examples might include um, uh, hash tables. We have content addressable memory in effect that's implemented, uh, linked lists, uh, rings, um, statistics, uh, where you can just fire off increment a set of counters and your thread doesn't even need to worry about it. It'll get done with a read, modify, write, lockless on your behalf. Um, so the, the other parts of this are, are probably not very surprising. There's a bunch of Ethernet ports, a bunch of PCI ports, uh, DRAM interfaces, etc. The one interesting part is maybe there's multiple PCIe interfaces. So with some of these NICs, you can actually plug into um, each socket on a motherboard independently in order to get the data into the right uh, socket. So there's uh, something available in the Intel Xeons called Data Direct I.O. where you write over PCIe through the cache into memory. And then when, the, when your software executes, it's already in the cache. And by having these multiple PCIe buses, um, it's possible to, to get it to the, to the memory of the correct socket with some of the, the cards that are available. So let's uh, peel the onion further and look into the, the actual insides of the chip. So the, 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 the chip in this class of um, uh, smart NICs has load balancing built in between these different threads or cores. So that load balancing, you could choose to, to do it based on like the five tuple and always send the flow to a certain place. But what we typically do is we just let all the packets share all the threads and it will typically just take the availability of your um, core or thread into account. In other words, for the, um, the one with the least amount of backlog of work, it will go and direct packets there. Using a, a construct called a work queue um, to, to do that. Then uh, the, the software is really implemented as a pool of threads run to completion style. So it will go and do passing of packets, matching actions, whatever these data paths um, require. We typically insert a, a, a flow tracker in there to go and bypass the 
the matching steps. So let's say there's multiple lookups that you maybe need to do. You need to do a route lookup, you need to do a policy lookup in a firewall table and so on. By caching the result in this flow tracking table, you, you can all boil it down to a single lookup. And because the chip has a content addressable memory instruction called uh, CAM lookup and add, it'll very easily go and either find it or add it if it's not there yet. Um, to go and implement that. Now, um, th th this also leverages the, the DRAM, where with the large DRAM you can keep track of mi millions of, of flow entries. Uh, so, the, the way the actions are typically done is um, they're typically done in, in on chip memory, as even memory on the core. So, so there's a single cycle memory that um, you, you use to keep the packet headers and you extract them. Then you can go and modify the packet headers on chip, on the core, and at the end, flush them out again to the packet. And that way the actions are also quite efficient. Uh, the last point here is that the processing time may vary from packet to packet. And uh, because of that, you may get reordering. So, so a packet that maybe arrived um, first takes long to look up because it's the first one in, an, in a new flow. And then it, 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 it goes out later of the workers than, than another packet. And because of that, there's a need for a reordering engine that will correct the packet order to the original packet order. And again, there's, there's hardware support for that, such that the software doesn't need to take care of this. So the net net of this is really that what you'll see today in terms of the software that, that is going to be implemented is just write whatever one needs to be done with one packet. And the system will automatically parallelize this and run it on many packets per second and deal with the ordering and the locking and all these things for you. If one wants to, one can extend this with um, uh, more complicated topologies. So, so you don't need to go past match act. You could have plugins that process packets in arbitrary ways. You could build a packet generator, packet sync. Uh, all these things are possible. It's also possible to um, make a, a, a different topology where if you want to go and, and build a pipeline and um, send packets to a different um, core, you're welcome to do that. There are constructs available, rings and work queues that allow one to const construct these um, pipelines. Uh, it could be a coprocessor style where you go to another core and comes back when it's done. It could be a um, pipeline where you, you give it to that core and it will immediately transmit when it's finished, etc. But you don't need to do any of this. It's, it's, it's really up to you how to lay out the code. It's typically not necessary. When it's typically easier to just write run to completion code for the packets. Um, so uh, for those that, that are not familiar with P4, this is just an example of a P4 program. Uh, we'll see this in a lot more detail later. But basically, you declare the headers. You declare um, the pass graph tables and actions. And this one slide is, is the entire NIC. It's very simple because it only match, matches the ingress port and it only um, does port to port forwarding, so it doesn't have intelligence. But nevertheless, this is an entire NIC implemented in P4. So you can see it's fairly high level language. Um, and you can easily add things that are matched in this table construct and add things that are modified in the action construct to do a match action pipeline. If you want to do arbitrary things, 
here's an example of um, a very simple nick in C where it goes and the top part here is just initializing things. The, 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 the main part here is, is really saying um, let's go and receive a packet uh, either from the wire or from the host. So half of the threads will go and service the one, half of the threads will service the other. At this point, one could go and modify the packet. There's a pointer available to the packet payload. There's metadata available for things like the ingress port, egress port, timestamp, etc. And then here it goes and transmits. And as you can see, this main function is really just sitting in a loop. Get a packet, do things, send it, continue. So it's just day in the life of a packet. Reordering gets taken care of. So what can one do with, with these things? I mean, we, we can go on and on about the use cases, but, but here's an example of um, a fully customized data path where you would have, um, this is an actual demo we did in a, just a couple of days implementation time. Uh, P4 is used to match and then meter certain protocols. Uh, some C extensions to P4 are used to, to do some security processing, latency measurement, etc., etc. So, so you can build up a fairly complicated pipeline, um, or, or I should just say a, a chain of, of functions in, in, the, in the smart NIC and still have them interact with the virtual machines in the ways that we discussed earlier. So to summarize, uh, the programming models include just using it with existing data planes and um, using it then to speed them up, save server resources, call the APIs that these provide. Other ways to do it would be programming it yourself um, using um, P4 or C or eBPF. That's what the rest of the day is about. Um, so we're all very excited about this area. Um, it's, 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 it's really, um, I guess, emerging um, in, in the same sense as maybe five years ago, um, SDN was a, was a new thing that everybody was studying and, and working on. But now um, acceleration and smart NICs and maybe more VNF in a V is, is the hot topic. And this is why um, we see a lot of activity in all these bodies around data plane performance, around how to integrate all these things. So um, we are hoping that, that you go and participate um, in these bodies. And um, again, there's the VNF offload API, uh, but there's many other activities that are quite interesting that these bodies to follow. So with that, um, I'll hand over to our next speaker. Are there any questions, sir? You mentioned that uh, first packet, uh, or first packet of each row are going to, to the to the kernel to the host. Yep. Uh, are there any ways to prevent that? Because you can imagine that uh, if there are some Yep. Like you, you receive an attack. Uh, it's some random attack. Yep. How to uh, how to stop uh, how to maybe not offload but prevent the host to be uh, overloaded or something. At all, yeah. Yeah, that's an question for the recording. Okay. Uh, the question was uh, if the first packet of each flow goes to the host it may be able to overload the host in, in a certain denial of service attack scenario and is there therefore a way to not have the first packet go to the host and more preemptively install the flow entries. Um, so I used the example of OVS because that's maybe the most familiar to people. 
And the way OVS as its, its architecture works is um, OVS packets coming into the kernel data path um, will encounter no flow entries and then they will go and go to user space. And OVS will go and install things into the um, kernel data path triggered by this first packet of a flow. Now the smart NIC tries to be compatible with that and it will go and offload the kernel uh, entries. So this is really just a characteristic of how, how the existing data path OVS is implemented. There is another one called vRouter that operates differently where vRouter like Contrail um, installs the flow entries when you get your policy from your controller and vRouter will preemptively go and put them in the kernel table and then the SmartNIC can also preemptively get them. So it's really dependent on the data plane how these things have to work. It's, it, it's definitely not a given that you have to trigger the download of the flow entries by the first packet of a flow but it just happens to be how OVS works and therefore the SmartNIC implementation tries to be compatible with that. Uh, if one went and threw away the kernel data path and one just used OVS as an agent, as a, as a way to be the, the open flow protocol handler, so to speak, one could go and do a fully preemptive uh, offload. And uh, in fact, um, that has been done and it's in use in a carrier now for a couple of years already with these smart NICs operating that way. Of course, if you write your own with P4 or something, you, you can do whatever you want. You, you could do it reactively in this way or preemptively. Any more questions? Yep. Thanks. If you have uh, more smart NICs in the host machine, actually architecture is going to the state when CPUs are handling more and more PCI express lanes, like new AMD architecture, for example. How to aggregate those smart NICs in some smart way? Or do I have to play with each one separately? Or is there any way to play with them together? Um, for example, in DPDK way, uh, we can treat them as interfaces in Linux, aggregate them somehow and uh, play with them on a little bit different level. How is it with SmartNix then? Yeah, the, the, there's a number of answers to that. Um, the SmartNix present um, interfaces to the host or the guest. And in that sense, um, the, the different SmartNix, or as I said earlier, there's also option of having more than one PCIe bus on a single SmartNix. Um, these all would have their own um, interfaces. And in that case, you, you would present them as, as different uh, natives, as different DPDK Palmer drivers, etc. Now, there are things available in the Linux kernel, like the bonding teaming driver that allows you to aggregate um, different natives. There's also in DPDK a, a bonding facility where you could have more than one DPDK uh, on the bottom and it looks like a single one on the top. And this way, um, this can kind of merge together the traffic from the different smart mix. There is an issue there though, because um, if you contemplate the traffic going to the host, you, you're just merging it together and, um, or to the guest, I mean, in, into the server. And that's very clear. You, you want to go into this VM. But if you, if you contemplate the traffic going the other direction, you now need to decide, am I going to this smart NIC or am I going to that smart NIC? And if you're just load balancing or if you just do like a... Um, a file over between the one that's working and the one that isn't working, then that's fairly easy. But if you actually 
um, uh, almost like want to build a switch that's spread across the smart mix, then you really need to do your first bit of your switching to pick which smart mix. And then the smart mix can go and do the rest of the switching. So then that makes it more difficult uh, because you now cannot offload that first step of the switching which decides which smart mix should you go to. Uh, so there are kind of ways around that. Um, some of these products actually have a special additional PCIe or a special additional Ethernet where you can connect up the smart mix such that you always send it to, to, to the one or the other, or like either one doesn't matter, but um, that the smart mix can then hand it off to another smart mix and still preserve the offloading. Yeah, so it's a complex problem. Uh, if you, if you invi invent time travel, then you could, um, you know, go to the smart NIC, realize you've made a mistake, the packet should have gone to the other one, travel back in time with packet metadata fixed, and then go to the correct one. But I think if you invented time travel, then you're probably just going to win the lottery or something. You wouldn't worry about this problem. So... Yeah, so, so, so that's kind of where, where things are at. Right.